Hello, and thank you for attending tonight's Ask the Experts virtual event, Don't Wait, Relieving Joint Pain. I am Dr. Tom Thompson. I am an orthopedic surgeon at Cleveland Clinic Akron General. Joining me this evening are three other orthopedic surgeons. Two are from the Cleveland Clinic Orthopedic Rheumatologic Institute, and one other is from Akron General Orthopedics. Now we are here tonight to answer your questions, share our expertise, and provide clinical insights about hip, knee, shoulder, wrist, foot and ankle concerns, and to discuss why it's important that you not delay care. We have received questions with topics varying from treatments to decrease pain and increase function without joint replacement, to being curious about what movement is like if you have a joint replacement. Plus, there were lots of questions regarding treatments for arthritis, pain, pain relievers, and supplements. By the way, the Cleveland Clinic Orthopedic Program is ranked the best orthopedics program in Ohio by U.S. News and World Report. Now, we'd like to say that if you have avoided care because of the pandemic, because of COVID-19, please be assured that our locations are safe and ignoring a health issue can have consequences. We want you to know that you are valued and that your health is a priority. And I'm going to be giving you a couple of numbers that you can call for appointments in just a couple seconds. Please understand that even in the midst of this awful COVID-19 pandemic, which of course is getting better, whether you've received the vaccine or not, if you are experiencing a joint related issue, we encourage you to make an appointment by calling in Cleveland, 216-444-2606 and in the Akron area, 330-344-2663. And this along with other information will be sent to you after the show is over. So with that said, let's take a few minutes to do some introductions, then we'll dive right into the questions. So to kick it off, once again, uh, I am Dr. Tom Thompson. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Cleveland Clinic Akron General and also your moderator tonight. I've been in practice more than 30 years in the Akron area. I started out doing just about everything in orthopedics. That's the way things were back then. But as my uh, practice has matured, so to speak, uh, I am now doing primary hip and knee arthroplasties on my established patients. I grew up in Elkhart, Indiana, uh, undergrad at Brown. My med school was St. Louis University. I did my orthopedic residency right here at Cleveland Clinic, and I did an arthritis surgery fellowship in Denver. We will move on to our next orthopedic surgeon, who I understand is a lifelong Cleveland sports fan and that is Dr. Kirk Haydet. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it, so my name is Kirk Haydet. Um, I'm a uh, orthopedic surgeon um, on the west side of, uh, of Cleveland. Um, I see patients and do surgery uh, in Lorraine and Avon. Um, I uh, focus on the hand and upper extremities, so from the collarbone, shoulder, all the way down to the fingertip. Um, I'm, uh, born and raised on the west side of Cleveland, uh, grew up in Rocky River, went to St. Ignatius for high school. Um, I, uh, did my undergrad at Georgetown in Washington, D.C., um, medical school at Cincinnati. Um, I did my, uh, residency in Toledo and then spent a year in Milwaukee, um, doing a hand and upper extremity, um, fellowship, um, yeah, so hand and upper extremity, uh, you know, and I, I love being back on the west side of Cleveland, taking care of people who I'm a part of. Do you have anything that's a favorite? Um, I really enjoy doing uh, shoulder replacements, um, and we'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty about that. Um, there's a couple different kinds. And then um, uh, it, taking care of thumb arthritis as well. But but really anything in the upper extremity, I I love taking care of. 
Oh, very good. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Dr. Sarah Lynn Miniachi Coxhead, who grew up in this business and is a second generation orthopedic surgeon. Take it away. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, like Dr. Thompson said, my name is Sarah Lynn Miniachi Coxhead, and I'm actually originally Canadian. I grew up in Toronto, and then uh, my dad is an orthopedic surgeon and came to the Cleveland Clinic in 2003. Um, I then followed my family down here and did medical school at Case Western, my residency at the University of Rochester, and then a foot and ankle fellowship at the University of Toronto. Um, I've been at the Cleveland Clinic since 2016, um, and my practice is getting big and then getting nice and settled into staff uh, world. Uh, I, like I said, I'm a foot and ankle surgeon. Uh, I love doing uh, ankle replacements and big deformity correction, but also just like Kirk, do everything from kind of the middle of the leg all the way down to the toes. Thank you, doctor. All right, finally, we have Dr. Paul Wilkie, who is a double Buckeye. Dr. Wilkie. Hi, thanks, Dr. Thompson. And uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, like you said, I'm Dr. Paul Wilkie. I, I am uh, originally from Pittsburgh, but grew up primarily here in Northeast Ohio, um, making me a, uh, a lifelong Buckeye fan. Um, I do, do still hold some allegiances to those Pittsburgh teams, so Kirk, try not to hold that against me. Um, I did grow up here in Talmadge, Ohio, graduated from Talmadge High School. Uh, at that point, went down to The Ohio State University uh, for four years of undergraduate, followed by four years of medical school, making me a double Buckeye. Uh, then came back uh, to Akron at Akron General for their orthopedic surgery residency program. Um, I was uh, under the tutelage of Dr. Thompson for five years, uh, graduating there in 2015, then went to Pittsburgh for a year, uh, sub-specializing in adult reconstruction, uh, mostly knee and hip replacements, um, and the revision of those, uh, and then came back and joined the practice here with Cleveland Clinic Akron General Orthopedics. Uh, so my practice now, primarily 90 to 95% of it, is doing primary uh, knee and hip replacements as well as revision knee and hip replacements, um, and I like to focus on that. I love spending time here in Northeast Ohio. My family's all here. Uh, my wife was raised here, our two kids. Um, so uh, I don't plan on leaving anytime soon, and um, I really enjoy what I do. Thank you, Paul. And you do have the first question. That first question is the following. How can you tell the difference between joint pain and ligament pain? And what if the pain is not constant, but recurring? Sure, so um, joint pain, typically arthritic pain, is something that comes on rather slowly, uh, is slowly progressively worsening over time. Uh, is usually focused mostly right around the joint, whether it be the knee, the hip, the shoulder, the wrist, whatever it is, um, the area of it is focused right around that joint. It's mostly worsening with weight-bearing activities, uh, increased time spent up and moving, um, whereas a ligamentous type of pain is typically more from like an acute injury, a twisting injury, uh, perhaps a fall, uh, ligamentous pain you would notice more with pivoting types of activities, perhaps climbing, uh, twisting uh, is more uh, what I would attribute to ligamentous, uh, whereas joint pain uh, and typically arthritic pain is, is chronic, um, sort of a dull achy pain, maybe tender to the touch, uh, could have some swelling attributed to it as well. Can you, can you massage away arthritis pain? You really can't massage away arthritis pain as much as you can sort of soft tissue pain. Uh, when somebody may have, you know, tendonitis or inflammation um, from, you know, a ligamentous or tendinous type of injury, certainly soft tissue massage uh, can help to alleviate that um, or help that along the way. When somebody has pain from an arthritic or, or worn out joint, uh, it becomes more of a mechanical issue. So there's no way to really massage that, that pain or discomfort out of the joint. Thank you, Dr. Haydet. You have the next question. I've been needing both shoulders replaced for some time. Can you tell me more about shoulder arthroplasty and is it an option 
if I live alone? Sure. Well, to start, certainly it's an option if you live alone. Um, we have a lot of services such as home health um, where we can, you know, kind of make any and all situation work. Um, I, one question I get a ton is, am I too old to have this done? And I, I don't put an age limit on it at all. So as far as uh, shoulder arthroplasty um, or, or shoulder replacement, um, to start, there are two kinds of shoulder replacement, a standard or anatomic shoulder replacement or a reverse replacement. Um, and we would pick that one individually. Um, and what it really boils down to is if you have a good rotator cuff or not, um, you have to have a good, strong, healthy rotator cuff to support a standard replacement. If not, we have a really good option and, and we do the reverse replacement. Um, as far as surgery, uh, it's typically um, a one night uh, uh, stay in the hospital. Um, you come in, the anesthesiologist will completely numb your arm up. Then we um, give you general anesthesia. We do an incision like this across the, the front of your shoulder to go in and replace the arthritic ball and socket with um, uh, metal and plastic. Um, so instead of raw bone on raw bone, you got nice new parts. Um, and then uh, it, it, you're typically in, in a sling after surgery for, it, it ranges from six, or I'm sorry, um, two weeks to six. I, I tell patients to plan on six, but there are circumstances where we can get you out of the sling quicker. Um, and then uh, you, you stay overnight. We make sure your pain's um, under control. And I see you the next day and you, you work with occupational therapy and physical therapy. And when you're comfortable going home, you go home that next day. Um, we typically get you going into therapy uh, three, four days after surgery. Um, so we can uh, get you rehabbing right away and get you the best shoulder um, that we're able to. So are you saying then that you can come out of the sling at intervals? You're not stuck in that sling for all those weeks, are you? Absolutely. Um, and, and one really nice part about you staying overnight in the hospital is that gives you opportunity to to work with our physical therapists and occupational therapists. They'll show you um, those questions that maybe I'm not the best answering, like how the heck do I get dressed? How do I wash under my arm, et cetera? They'll tell you how to come in and out of the sling, how to do it safely and how, how to you know move forward with life. Well, you, you're stuck in a sling for most of the time for the next six weeks or so. But you can come in and out. Uh, absolutely. And I'll just ask the question because I know our audience is wondering, they show you how to, you know, go to the bathroom with one hand. They, 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 they leave no stone unturned. So that's yeah, a good, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> All right. Dr. Miniachi Cox said, you have the next question. I have sprained my ankles throughout my lifetime many, many times. I'm now suffering from terrible ankle pain all the time, and they, they, they sprain all the time. What can I do? Absolutely. So I think someone in that situation, we want to start with an evaluation. Uh, that would include an office visit with a physical exam and some x-rays. Often someone who has chronic instability of their ankle or someone who sprains their ankle a lot can have what we call ligament laxity. And that's something that we can either address with physical therapy or sometimes with surgery. However, we know that people who have injuries to their ankles throughout their life, whether that's a fracture or chronic ankle sprains are at higher risk of getting ankle arthritis. So your chronic pain may be due to arthritis, which then we would have different treatment options, which we're gonna talk about. And that includes either ankle replacements or ankle fusions. Okay, very good. Um, what's a balance board and how does that play into um, like unstable ankles? I've heard about that, but what is it? 
Absolutely. So those are things like BOSU balls or, you know, the boards that have the ball in the middle that you can balance on. And we use that in physical therapy for something called functional rehabilitation. And what we know about people with ankle sprains is they tend to have problems with their proprioception or knowing where your body is in space. And by practicing on a balance ball or a balance board, it helps retrain the muscles and the nerves to help improve uh, your strength in your ankles. Can that type of non-operative treatment sometimes be successful with the kind of problem being described here? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of the foot and ankle treatments, we often start non-operatively because they can be successful and only move to surgery when we've exhausted all the non-operative options. Okay, very good. So I have the next question, and that is, when is joint replacement the only option? Well, I can think of two or three examples. The classic from many years ago, you don't see this often nowadays, would be a rheumatoid patient who, for instance, is um, sitting in a wheelchair most of the time, maybe for months, and they've developed contractures around their hips and knees at like right angles. And so if you try to get them up, they can't walk, they're, they're bent. So that's an example actually of where perhaps both knees, especially the knees need to be replaced. There are a couple other examples. Some individuals are extremely, how do I say, tough. Pain doesn't seem to bother them. And, um, in some of those instances, whether it's hip or knee, they may be eroding right through the bone. Let's say in the case of the hip, they might be run, running their ball right through the pelvis to the point where there's not much bone remaining to reconstruct, even though they can tough it out. So that's why you need to get evaluated early just to see where you're at. Nobody's saying you're gonna get surgery coming in to see one of us but we need to kind of see where you're at so the job doesn't become tougher. And in a similar light, uh, similar things can occur with the knee when it comes to a deformity. Uh, around 70 to 80% of the deformity that you see in this country is bow-legged or what we call varus. And about 20% or so goes the other way called valgus or a knock knee. Um, particularly on the knock knee type, you may think that, well, it's not that bad, but as you know, the months and years go by, you get a bigger and bigger angle. And that's why you need to get evaluated so that that type of reconstruction, let's say you've got a 40 degree angle suddenly of your knee going in does not become, if you, know, you get my drift on this old reference, it does not become a Cecil B. DeMille production. And if you get to it soon enough, it becomes a much easier reconstruction so that you can get fixed properly. So that, that would be my answer to that question. Dr. Hayden, what's the standard surgical treatment and recovery time for a carpal tunnel condition? Sure, so this is, you asked me earlier what my favorite cases are, and I love doing uh, carpal tunnels. So the standard treatment is making a small incision um, kind of at the base uh, of the palm um, where I, where a surgeon um, dissects down and takes the pressure off of the median nerve. Um, the, the carpal tunnel is, as it sounds, a tunnel. Um, on three sides are bone, and there's a soft tissue ligament called the transverse carpal ligament that sort of closes that ring. What we do surgically is we cut that ligament to allow the carpal tunnel to open up and it takes pressure off of the, the, the median nerve. Um, so uh, most of these cases um, are done under local anesthesia. Um, so it's kind of nice, you don't have to um, be without anything to eat or drink. You don't have to undergo anesthesia, so it, it, it's potentially safer. Um, it, it's convenient. Um, I did one today, and uh, 
the patient was able to drive him, him himself in and out of the uh, the operating room. Um, as far as recovery, um, I, I put patients in a um, splint just overnight and they take it off the next day. Um, and I let them start lightly using their hand the next day. Nothing crazy because we don't want to split open the incision, but by after by about two weeks, I let them get back to most everything. The one thing is I don't want them hopping into a hot tub or swimming pool until the wound is fully healed. Sometimes that can take about three weeks or so. Does does that ligament, which you divide, is that ligament important for any particular function? Do you lose some aspect of your wrist function by dividing the transverse carpal ligament? Uh, You you don't at all. it, one thing that can happen after a carpal tunnel release is, like I said, you, you've got bones on three sides and then you've got that ligament that you cut. Afterwards, those bones sort of spring open and it can lead to pain on either side of the incision, um, something we call pillar pain. Um, it's something that uh, I, I see um, happen um you know, from time to time after uh, recovery, but that's something that goes away completely uh, with time. And, and there are no long lasting um, uh, dysfunctions um, from releasing that ligament. Okay. In, in, in fact, it, it sometimes um, permanent dysfunction can, can um, arise from not doing a carpal tunnel release allowing that nerve to remain compressed over time. Yes. And it, it remains compressed long enough and you can have permanent sensory and um, deficits with strength of your hand. Right, that's where the muscle at the base of the thumb shrivels. Absolutely, yeah, we call that, it, this area of the hand we call the phenar eminence. And um, it will often lead to phenar atrophy or, or wasting away of those muscles. We, uh, of course, want to put a plug in for one of our Cleveland Clinic uh, orthopedic surgeons back after World War II, Dr. George Phelan, was a longtime member of the Cleveland Clinic faculty, and he popularized and actually put carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, decompression surgery on the global map with with his uh, interest and so forth. And he was a Cleveland Clinic uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, right here in Cleveland, Ohio, back after World War II and in the 50s. Okay, Dr. Wilkie, you are next. Does exercise reduce knee pain and arthritis pain? Absolutely. So just like any joint, um, the joint likes motion. It likes to move. Uh, I saw a slide earlier uh, in the introduction thing that said motion is lotion. Uh, which I thought was pretty good. I think I'm going to use that from here on out. Um, but it, a joint likes to move. I think most patients with with mild, moderate, even severe knee or hip arthritis would agree. Once you get up and go and start moving around and walking around, your pain actually improves uh, up to a point. Um, you know, if you walk a few miles, you may start having some limiting pain. Uh, but being sedentary and sitting for long periods of time and then getting up and going, uh, you tend to have uh, more pain after that. So. I never discourage people from getting back to uh, their lower impact aerobic activities. So what are those? Things like uh, walking, biking, hiking, using an elliptical machine, getting in a swimming pool, doing some laps. All of that is is aerobic activity. So it gets the heart rate up. It burns some calories, but you're not beating up your joints. Uh, You're not putting a whole lot of heavy impact on your joints. Trying to avoid things like running, jumping, jogging. Uh, certainly that puts a lot more impact on your joints, um, but those lower impact activities can certainly help um, with your, your knee pain. And, and it's not going to cause more harm to those joints that may have some wear and tear in them already. So uh, my girlfriend and I like to walk in the mornings and uh, sometimes we walk on the cement sidewalk in our neighborhood. And then sometimes we go to the nearby high school that has a tartan turf spongy surface that we walk around. Dr. Wilkie, which one of those surfaces do you think would be better since we both have knee arthritis? 
I think it makes you know perfect sense that uh, the softer um, surface is going to probably cushion some of that impact um, more so even than walking on a softer surface because a lot of people don't have access to something like that. But you know, using a nice, steady, well-padded shoe. Um, not wearing your shoes that you've had around for five or six years, but something that offers you uh, a good amount of support uh, and that fits your uh, foot nicely, maybe offers you even some ankle support. Uh, I think Dr. Miniachi will talk about that in uh, a moment here, but um, something that provides you a lot of support uh, and gives you some cushion uh, and also walking on a nice flat level surface. Um, you know, I did bring up hiking earlier uh, but certainly rougher terrain, even out on a golf course or a trail or something like that, you may find exacerbates your pain more so than walking on a sidewalk or a nice flat level surface. Okay, fair enough. Dr. Miniachi Cox said, what is the best over-the-counter options for relieving arthritis pain in the foot and ankle? <clears throat> and what are some other non-surgical options? Absolutely. So, um, just like every other uh, joint in the body, we get arthritis and there's some over-the-counter medications and creams that you can use. So the anti-inflammatory family, things like ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, Aleve are all things that can be very helpful with arthritis type pain as long as they're safe for you to take and you can speak to your doctor about those. Um, the cream that I like is a Voltaren cream, which is now over the counter. And that's actually an over the counter medicine. So you don't need a prescription for it anymore. That actually changed last year. It got overshadowed by the pandemic. I think it would have been a lot bigger of a story had uh, there not been a pandemic going on. Um, in terms of for the foot and ankle specifically, we like to use a lot of bracing and stiffer soled shoes. The idea behind this is that it keeps the motion limited in both the ankle and the foot, which helps decrease that pain. So any of the over-the-counter lace-up braces, or if you have more of a foot arthritis, a stiffer sole shoe. So when you take your shoe and you grab the heel and you grab the toe and you try to bend it, you want it to be nice and stiff. Those are shoes that tend to be a little bit better for people with arthritis in the ankle and foot. So going back to what Dr. Wilkie was uh, talking about regarding reducing impact loading on the upper joints in the lower extremity. Uh, do you have any particular advice regarding shoe wear in terms of cushion? Uh, I, I don't think any of us have any conflicts of interest here in terms of brands. And do you have any favorites? Name a couple and why. What, what's a cushioned footwear for arthritis in, in the legs? Sure. So, uh, yeah, no disclosures here. I have uh, no brand allegiance. So I think uh, the Hoka shoe is a new shoe that's been on the market now for a few years. It's spelled yeah. H-O-K-A. And that one I find a lot of my patients really enjoy. I think, one, it's a stiffer shoe. It's a thicker uh, sole that has cushion, but it also has a little bit of a rocker bottom. And for patients with both ankle and foot arthritis, the rocker bottom is really helpful. Uh, it's unfortunate, but sh the Skecher, Skecher Shape Up shoe was a great rocker bottom shoe, but they've taken it off the market. So, uh, Didn't I know that? No. yeah, I guess they got sued because uh, they were making false claims. So, uh, which is disappointing to foot and ankle surgeons because it was a great shoe to tell my patients. We to don't get. know anything but, about that. Okay. <laughs> but the Hoka shoe uh, is a great shoe. Um, I think New Balance um, A6 are also great shoes that have good insoles with good uh, cushion um, and well supportive shoes. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. I have the next question. Uh, when are you too old to have joint replacement surgery? Well, I'm going to knock that one out real quick. It's not the years in the life. It's the life in the years. So as long as you have uh, stable uh, medical conditions and uh, nothing that would interfere with, you know, reasonable surgery, most orthopedic surgery is like you know, low or moderate risk, generally speaking, um, you're, you're going to be okay. There are some instances from a cardiac standpoint that you, you could be 50 and have, have a problem that would perhaps uh, uh, disqualify you from having any surgery, and you could be 90 and be in great shape and have surgery. So uh, my suggestion is don't, don't ever dwell on age because that's, that's really not, not an issue. 
Okay, we are about halfway through now, so we're going to come back to Dr. Hayden. What non-surgical treatment is available for chronic shoulder pain? And let's see, when is it best to just do physical therapy or have injection versus a surgical solution? So I, I think it's reasonable to always try conservative or non-surgical treatment before you jump into surgery. Um, and, uh, it, and I think uh, the other um, panel would, would echo that. Um, as far as what we can do non-surgically for chronic shoulder pain is number one, <clears throat> we got to get you in um, to the office and examine you, take x-rays and figure out what, what what's the source. Is it is it arthritis? Is it rotator cuff? Is it frozen shoulder? And then once we know where the pain's coming from, we can we can direct you. Um, oftentimes that can include cortisone injections or, or steroid injections. Um, and uh, oftentimes it, it, it can include uh, physical therapy. Um, oral anti-inflammatories or like Dr. Uh, Miniachi Cox had said, uh, topical Volterra gel are all great options. Um, but yeah, getting in to see your doc and and um, getting diagnosed with, with what the source of pain is, uh, it can kind of be your springboard a, a, as far as, uh, um, you know, what treatments to consider next. Um, and what I tell patients is they always ask, when, when should I have a shoulder replacement? And I say, you know, let's do our best to avoid surgery and and, and keep you comfortable doing what you want, um, you, you know, with all of these different um, treatments that I outlined. But if you get to the point where day in, day out, you're miserable and, and you find yourself um, saying you can't do this, that, or the other because of the pain, well, shoot, I think that's the time to spring for surgery. Um, it, if you're able to do everything you want and, and you're not in bad pain, well, uh, you know, no matter how bad your x-ray looks, you probably don't need surgery. But when we've tried everything short of surgery and you're miserable and you find yourself not doing what you want to do, what you love, well, then that's it's time to consider surgery. I mean, that our, our job is to keep you doing what you want to do. And um, if you get to that point, that's that's when you want to consider talking to one of us. So, so you've alluded to something I think that's important for, for all four of us, and that is you're indicating we treat the patient, not the x-ray. Doesn't absolutely. matter how bad the x-ray looks, correct? Yeah, you're absolutely right. That, that's a paradigm that we all learn in training is you treat the patient, not the x-ray. Um, you, you know, some patients have x-rays you know, there's some arthritis, but it's not horrendous, but we've tried everything. And, and I think that's reasonable to go for surgery. And there are some people where you look at, you look at the x-rays and you cringe because it looks so bad, but they're not in pain. And it'd be silly to put a patient through uh, all the risks of surgery if, it, you know, if, if they're not painful in the first place. So sure. absolutely. If they, have, if they have enough bone stock and you're not eroding something important, so be it. I'm going to. I'm gonna... And, and that's a good point. Like you had said previously, there are times when, you know, even if you're not in the worst pain, it, it, in the shoulder in particular, um, it, it, the shoulder is a ball and socket. Sometimes the bone on the socket side can wear away such that it makes a, a routine surgery um, very difficult and sometimes, you know, kind of takes it off the table. Um, so, yeah, to your point, Dr. Thompson, there are some times when, you know, we need to maybe urge a patient or, or just let a patient know why, you know, um, it, it, surgery now would be better than trying to push it off even longer. Okay, that, that's very good. Dr. Maniachi Cox said, when do you fuse and when do you do an arthroplasty on toe joint issues? So great question. Um, so when it really depends on the patient, um, 
Toe fusion or great toe fusion is the gold standard for great toe arthritis. Um, tell, tell, us, tell us about what, what you mean by that. In other words, you got the big toe. Absolutely. It likes the Dickens when you push off. Take it from there. Correct. So your big toe joint is kind of that big, you know, if I use my thumb as an example, it's this joint right here of your toe. And right, when you have pain with push-offs, often people have a big bump over their big toe. Um, that's very uh, classic for, um, we call it first MTP or great toe arthritis. It has been fused since the beginning of time, and it is a very successful surgery. What I tell my patients is it, our gait analysis studies show that there's no changing gait uh, after a first MTP fusion. So people can walk fairly normally. And there's actually a soccer player in Europe and a tennis player in Australia who had first MTP fusions and continued to play their sports. So you can still be very active with it. And that's why it's still the gold standard and that's why we still go to it. It's one of my more successful surgeries that I do. My patients are very happy. Um, the big downsides to a fusion is um, there are some limitations with certain yoga poses. Uh, if you want to get into a more crouched position and that toe would really be bent up. Um, but I will be honest, most people with end-stage arthritis, their great toe aren't doing those things anymore, or they've learned to modify. So it's actually not that big of an issue if you fuse. However, wearing heels is one of the downsides to fusions. You are that was limited. A question. You are limited to about an inch heel, which is a kitten heel, so about this big. Um, and uh, that is something I can't get around. That is a limitation of the fusion. Now, arthroplasty for the great toe uh, is gaining some traction. There are a couple implants on the market that are showing some promise. Um, and I really take that as an individualized conversation. I think it has to be the right patient uh, to talk about an arthroplasty in the great toe. Okay, and a follow-up question would be, do you do a different angle of fusion for women versus men? I don't, I tend to do it about the same. For both my men and women, I want their big toes sitting just a few millimeters off the floor when they stand to allow for proper rollover when they walk. Um, I think the problem with doing too much of that up motion or dorsiflexion is that your toe can then actually rub on your shoe, which can be more problematic. So typically I try to keep in the same uh, ballpark for both men and women. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, Dr. Wilkie, I'm going to ask you a preliminary question before we get to your regular question. Sure. It, you obviously give cortisone injections, uh, usually in knees. What if you have a diabetic patient? How do you approach the, the cortisone injection with a diabetic patient knowing that that raises blood sugars in a diabetic? Sure, so I don't limit uh, cortisone injections in diabetic patients. I do counsel them that over the next two to three, sometimes five days, they will notice a slight bump or increase in their blood sugars depending on um, how often they're checking their blood sugars. Uh, certainly, I would limit the injection to just one knee. Uh, there are some patients who have bilateral knee arthritis, uh, and at that time, I would typically give them bilateral knee injections if they were both symptomatic. Uh, however, in diabetics, I do discuss with them uh, because of their condition uh, and their elevated blood sugar levels uh, and their propensity to have increased blood sugar levels with their diabetes that it's safer to uh, separate or spread those injections apart by at least several weeks um, versus in, in uh, patients without diabetes. I think it's perfectly fine to do both injections at one time. Now, there are other types of injections beyond uh, just the cortisone or the steroid injections, um, the visco supplementation or the gel or rooster comb injections that some people refer them to. Um, those are good options. The uh, literature is a little uh, more spread on those as far as uh, their outcomes. Um, what I counsel patients on those is they're just less predictably effective. Meaning I know if I give somebody a cortisone injection, probably 95% of patients are going to get some sort of relief in that joint. Maybe for six weeks, it may be for four months, but they're gonna get some sort of relief. Versus the visco supplementation or the gel injections, it's about 70% of patients that I find get some sort of relief. That other 30 to maybe even 35% of patients, they just don't get any relief from those types of injections. 
and you don't know what kind of relief you're going to get unless you try them. Um, there are insurance companies out there that do limit um, the types of visco supplementation that we can offer uh, because of the research that's out there that's a little more spotty as opposed to cortisone injections. Do you, um, if you have an insulin dependent diabetic, do you prefer preferentially go to the gel injection or do you still stick with the cortisone first? In those patients, I do uh, prefer to start more with the gel type of injections as opposed to the cortisone. Um, and it depends what my relationship is with that patient and how long I've known them. And if we've done cortisone injections in the past and they've had good outcome um, with minimal uh, effect on their blood sugars that they're able to um, tolerate quite well with their own insulin dosing, then certainly uh, a cortisone injection in that uh, instance or that case would be fine. Uh, but those patients, um, you know, I think they are probably better candidates to start more with a gel type of injection uh, rather than the, the cortisone at first. The, the insulin dependents, of course, are, are more sensitive to the cortisone reaction. Uh, give me a one-liner on the actual question. I'm concerned about going to the hospital during COVID. Will delaying joint replacement surgery make the pain worse? It can certainly make your joint condition worse. Uh, as we talked about several times already um, in this webinar, you know, as time goes on, your joint can start to wear into the bony support around that joint. And if that's the case, the joint not only becomes harder to reconstruct, uh, it becomes stiffer. Um, the best prediction of what your motion is going to be after surgery is what your motion is before surgery. So if you delay it years and you get a very stiff joint, it makes my job significantly harder to reconstruct that. And it makes your job significantly harder to rehabilitate that. Um, so certainly delaying it weeks to even maybe months is not going to uh, cause a lot of harm or dysfunction. Uh, but if you start looking at months into years, um, then that could be a different story. Is there any reason to delay because of this pandemic? At this point, I really don't think there is. Um, you know, okay. we have uh, very separate areas in the hospital for our elective types of procedures, where those patients are staying, if they do even need to stay in the hospital. Um, every patient is being tested as they come into the hospital, no, not only for their elective surgery, uh, but also if they're being admitted for some sort of medical condition as well. And that's most of my, exactly. It, most of my patients um, that are coming in for an elective surgery are either going home that same day or the very next day. So we are very much limiting how, how long or how often somebody actually has to stay in the hospital. Okay, very good. All right, Dr. Hadit, regarding shoulder replacement, once again, what is the long-term outlook and recovery time? Will it improve my range of motion on a joint particularly damaged from old trauma? Good question. Um, so as far as the long-term outlook, um, the number one goal I tell patients is pain relief. Um, as far as the motion coming out of, of surgery, um, standard replacements probably do have a bit better of a track record than reverse replacements as far as the motion. Um, standard replacements get you pretty close to normal going uh, a forward elevation, maybe to about there, where a reverse might be just to that. Um, but certainly um, pretty good in functional motion. Um, it, to hit on the, uh, the improved range of motion, uh, Dr. Wilkie uh, kind of hit a, an important point uh, by saying motion going into surgery kind of predicts motion coming out of surgery. That's for your standard um, arthritis uh, of, of the shoulder. Um, there is one condition um, called pseudoparalysis where a patient can barely move their arm at all. And that's because their rotator cuff has torn. Um, the rotator cuff typically keeps the ball and socket aligned. If it tears, the ball kind of hikes way up and 
all, all of the muscles um, are sort of out of balance and, and really can't move the shoulder at all. Um, and so it seems like a patient is paralyzed, e even though they're not. In that instance, th they'll show up in the office barely able to raise their arm. And after surgery, I'll, I'll do a reverse shoulder replacement and they're back to being able to, uh, to raise their arm up with full strength. So for our audience to set it straight, the patients who have arthritis and have a rotator cuff that's non-existent or significantly compromised, that's where we get into the concept of the reverse shoulder replacement. Absolutely, Correct? absolutely. So um, typically when we're talking in the, uh, in the office, I've got cool pictures to show you, but essentially it boils down to this. Um, if, if there's arthritis in the shoulder, then we need to do um, some sort of joint replacement. So that's step one. Step two is what kind of replacement we do. Um, do we do a standard or do we do a reverse? And it all sort of hinges on, it not, it, the, the major factor is if the rotator cuff is in good shape or not. If it's not in good shape, that means we can't um, we can't uh, rely on it to keep the ball and socket aligned, um, and so we make the decision to do a reverse replacement. By doing a reverse replacement, you're changing the complete biomechanics of the shoulder, um, and we basically make a shoulder functional again without the need. Uh, or, or the use of a uh, rotator cuff. Very good. All right, now I believe Dr. Miniachi Coxhead said this might be one of her more favorite questions, so here we go. I have plantar fasciitis. What treatment options are available when after physical therapy, my pain and limitations continue? So plantar fasciitis is very difficult uh, to treat. It is one of uh, the ailments of the foot that does take a very long time to get better. I tell my patients 12 to 18 months, and that's with treatment. After you try physical therapy, we actually have a great program here at the Cleveland Clinic called the TEAMS program, and it's a collaboration with the sports medicine, primary care physicians, and the physical therapists. And they work with you together, and they can provide other treatments uh, before we talk about surgery, including injections, which both corticosteroid injections, uh, PRP injections, and then the different treatment options like shockwave therapy, which is a high pulsed ultrasound to the bottom of your foot, and another treatment called 10X, which is a ultrasound probe that they actually put in your foot, and it uh, the ultrasound signal helps with the inflammation in the plantar fascia. And when we look at our data, those two procedures are actually quite successful. They're a little bit better than about 50%. You know, percent. They tend to be closer to 60% success rate. Surgery is always the last option when it comes to plantar fasciitis because it's about 50% effective. So I really do encourage all my patients to really try to exhaust non-operative treatment before we go down the surgery road. Okay, and again, you, you get out of bed and that first step in the morning is a killer on the bottom of your foot. Uh, you want to give it your best minute on the anatomy of the plantar fasci fascia and what exactly is plantar fasciitis? Absolutely. So the plantar fascia is a band of tissue. So think of it like a, almost like a sheet and it runs from your heel bone or your calcaneus right out to your toes. And when you are standing, the plantar fascia gets tight. And when you're relaxing or in bed and your foot is flopped, the plantar fascia is loose. And what plantar fasciitis is, is inflammation where this, the fascia or this tissue, a tissue attaches to your heel bone. And why it hurts with that first step in the morning is because all night your foot's been nice and relaxed. And then you go and you almost spring it open and it just wakes it up a little bit too much. And that's where you get the pain in your heel. 
And we know we don't have a great reason about why people get it, which is probably why we have so many treatments and we're not great at treating it. Um, but as some of the theories are that you also could have a tight Achilles tendon or a tight um, calf muscle. So a lot of the physical therapy is focused on both stretching the plantar fascia and stretching the Achilles tendon and um, calf muscles. Very good. All right, back to Dr. Wilkie. What is robotic assisted joint replacement surgery? Who manages the robot? Is the robot doing the surgery? What are the benefits of robotic surgery? Who is eligible? Excellent. So robotic joint replacement surgery is something um, that's certainly a very hot topic. Uh, it's been out really uh, five or six years now um, out for most mass production use. And what it is is essentially using robotic assistance or robotic guidance in the operating room um, with the surgeon really still doing the surgery, but the robot essentially is, is helping to place um, both the instruments as well as uh, potentially the implants in a little bit more precise or exact positions, um, or even you know positions that are more personal to that actual joint. Um, so with conventional knee arthroplasty or knee replacement surgery, uh, we use jigs, uh, and tools that, that put the joint itself in more of a conventional or uh, customary fashion, uh, which we found over the years works very well for most people. What we found is knee replacement surgery has about an 80 to 85% success rate. Uh, there's 15 to 20% of people that are, you know, maybe overall somewhat displeased or dissatisfied. What robotic joint replacement surgery is trying to do is focus on that 15 to 20% and perhaps take that down to 1% to 2% um, by placing these implants uh, more precise, we hope for better short-term outcomes. So what does that mean? That means improved uh, pain control, improved function in the short term. We hope for improved long-term outcomes. So we hope that Overall, these joints, if we put them in more precisely, more exacting, uh, more personal for that actual joint space, um, that these implants are going to last longer. Most implants now, we say, will last 15, 20 plus years. Um, if we can get another five to 10 years by putting them in more precisely because of the robot, certainly that's a win. Um, because the technology has only been out for five years, we don't know what the long-term results are going to be now, but um, it's definitely a hot topic. It's becoming more and more popular. It's still, you know, of all joint replacements done in the country, it's less than 12% uh, that are done with the assistance of a robot. But, but by all means, the surgeon is still doing the surgery. The robot is not performing the surgery. It's assisting the surgeon with uh, placement uh, of the implants and the instruments. Okay, excellent. I'm sure that that's a, uh, that's a hot question for a lot of people. Do you think a robot is a panacea for all joint replacement problems? Absolutely not. Um, you know, I, I think it's very interesting technology. Um, I personally really like it for the teaching aspects of it. Um, at Cleveland Clinic Akron General, as well as up north at Cleveland Clinic, uh, we teach fellows, residents, medical students, and um, what the robot really provides us with is more information. And it's what you do with that information um, that can make it a very valuable tool. What I like to do with the information is to use it to teach residents, to teach medical students why we're putting the implants in how we are and why we're adjusting um, potentially the bone cuts or the ligament releases, why we are. And, and the robot kind of allows us to do that before we do the surgery itself. You can almost perform the surgery before performing the surgery with the use of the robot. But you can still do surgery just using routine guides that you've used for years. Absolutely. I mean, anybody who does tens, if not hundreds of joint replacements a year can easily do a knee replacement. In fact, in less time than it takes them to do a robotic knee replacement. So it does somewhat slow you down because there's different steps to do. And by no means is it necessary. Um, will it provide us with better outcomes in the future? 
time will tell. Okay, Dr. Hayden, I've heard that rotator cuff surgery is a son of a gun. It really hurts. It's difficult to recover. Um, has anything improved with this, this problem and, and so forth over the years? Is it still a miserable experience to have your standard rotator cuff fixed? So uh, as the years go by, technology definitely improves. Um, we're <clears throat> getting uh, more sophisticated with uh, the anesthesia we give you and, and the nerve blocks and um, pain medication before and after surgery. Um, but to be completely honest, um, you know, rotator cuff surgery is one of the more painful surgeries I do. Um, not, not to say uh, that it shouldn't be done, but um, so the rotator cuff attached, if this is the ball and this is a rotator cuff, the rotator cuff is torn off. And what we do in surgery is reattach it. So we pull that rotator cuff back over. Um, and, 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 and it's a painful thing for, for a patient to have that tendon being pulled back over. Um, and the recovery, you know, it is not easy. Um, so in surgery, what we do is we pull that tendon back down to bone, but the real healing happens over the next six to eight weeks as the tendon actually heals back down on the bone. And we have not found as orthopedic surgeons yet how to speed up the biology of the body healing that tendon back down to bone. And it takes a good, um, sorry about that. It takes a good six to eight weeks for it to happen. Okay, thank you. Um, I have the next question and we're getting very close to our end time. Um, and my question is, what is same day outpatient joint replacement surgery? And what are the benefits and who is eligible? Well, we've, we've started that about two years ago now at Akron General, and there's many surgery centers around the country that are doing it as well as uh, other hospitals. You need to be, you know, in good health. And uh, the key to going home the same day is preparation with both physical therapy and occupational therapy. I mean, it might sound wild that, gee, you mean you're going to do this big operation on me? And then I'm gonna be in the recovery room for a few hours and maybe the nurses or some physical therapists will get me up and check me out, I'm gonna go home. Yes, that's what happens. And with appropriate preparation and especially with our regional pain blocks uh, and some other tricks with uh, pain management, we found that that works very well for certain select patients that qualify. I will leave it at that since we're running short here. Um, Dr. Miniachi, Cox said, can you replace an ankle joint? And what's the difference between an ankle joint replacement and arthroscopy treatment? Absolutely. So one of my favorite questions. Uh, so ankle arthritis, just like knee and hip, is you know destruction of cartilage in the ankle joint. And we do have options to treat them. One is an ankle replacement or an ankle arthroplasty. I'll step back a second and you know just talk about ankle arthroscopy. So arthroscopy is when we put the camera in a joint and that can be in any joint in the body. And so I use arthroscopy sometimes for patients who have small cartilage lesions in their ankle, but I can also use arthroscopy to help treat ankle arthritis in the form of an ankle fusion. And so our two options for ankle arthritis are ankle fusion and ankle replacement. Ankle fusion is when I scrape the cartilage away of the ankle joint and ask the body to heal bone from the tibia or your shin bone to the talus or your ankle bone. And when I do this with an arthroscopy, I use the camera to help me scrape out all the cartilage. And then I put screws across the joint to hold it together. Now, our other option for ankle arthritis is an ankle arthroplasty or a total joint of the ankle. And I like to say that the ankle arthroplasty is the little brother of the total hip and the total knee. Um, you know, those came around uh, quite some time ago and the ankle replacement is newer on the market and it's only been around for about 40 years. 
We're now on our third generation implant, and these ones are starting to see the same survivorships that we see in the hip and knee now. So with our most recent third generation implants, we see about an 80% survivorship at 15 to 20 years, which is much improved over wow. the first two generations. And so- And I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and they did not go well. And that's why people stayed with doing an ankle fusion. And so what I tell my patients is ankle fusions are not a bad operation. It is a great operation and we still do it because it works. But ankle replacements are now becoming much more popular. And since the implants and the technology is getting much better, we're seeing better survivorship. And so we're expanding our indications for ankle replacements. There's okay. a couple re sorry. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Didn't mean to cut you off. We, we are coming, my time just flew by, didn't it? And we, we like the questions. Um, this actually concludes our Cleveland Clinic Ask the Experts event. Now, uh, all of you will be getting a post-event email in the next day or so, and that will have some important information on what you heard. There'll be some links to all kinds of orthopedic resources and details on how to make that important appointment for the reasons we've outlined uh, today. There will also be a link to a recording of this event if you would like to go through it again to catch some of the answers that you might have missed or did not quite understand. We wanna once again say that please be assured that our locations are safe. If you are experiencing a health issue, make an appointment. We want you to know that you are valued and that your health is a priority. With that, we thank you and have a good evening.